Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for coming here this evening. We have a tremendous packed house, which is exciting. I see that the dozen emails I sent out obviously worked, so thank you for showing up. Uh, my name is Adam Roth. I'm the director of the Harrington School of Communication and Media and an associate dean in the College of Arts and Sciences. And tonight, uh, you are in store for a, a really special treat for the 11th annual Christian Amanpour Lecture in International Journalism. For those of you who don't know, Christian Amanpour is CNN's chief international correspondent and host of the nightly news program, Amanpour. She also happens to be one of the most famous graduates of the Harrington School of Communication and Media and the University of Rhode Island. And she graduated in 1983 with her journalism degree. And because of her generosity, we've been able to endow a lecture series to bring to campus some of the most outstanding names and figures in the journalism industry. And that's exactly what you're in store to see here tonight. Before I turn the microphone over to my colleague, Professor John Pantaloni, I want to thank, uh, first of all, members of our community who have joined us outside of URI. We always love for community members to come participate in events that we host on campus. And we also have some other special guests with us today. One of them is Mr. Michael Moore. He always makes me say, not the famous filmmaker, another Michael Moore. Michael Moore is an executive at Thomson Reuters Corporation. He's also a distinguished member of the Harrington School of Communication and Media's Executive Advisory Board. Also with us today is uh, Dr. Laura Bouvet, Vice Provost at the University of Rhode Island. Where are you, Laura? Somewhere there she is. <laughs> Laura, welcome. And also, as well, the new dean of the College of Arts and Sciences at URI, Dean Jeanette Riley. Welcome, Dean Riley. So I'm going to hand the mic over to Professor John Pantaloni. We have a great interview, question and answer style engagement for you tonight. And Professor Pantaloni is going to introduce our special speaker, uh, editor in chief and president of Reuters, Mr. Stephen Adler. Thank you, John. Thank you. Uh, I'm all set, I think. Yes? yes? Yes. Can you hear me now? Yeah. <laughs> okay. um, so before we get started, some of you are standing in the back. There are seats available. And if you're going to push your way into those seats, I'd rather you did it now than later. So feel free to come down in here. If there's an empty seat next to you, stick your hand up. There you go. <laughs> Fill in. OK. Well, you don't have to keep your hand up all day. I'm used to doing that in classes. So. Um, also, uh, if you want to participate in a Twitter conversation about this event, I can give you the hashtag if you'd like to do so. You're welcome to post on that. It is hashtag Reuters at, the word at, URI, cap, all caps URI. And if you don't know how to spell Reuters, you haven't been paying attention to the emails and the flyers, it's R-E-U-T-E-R-S, okay? Hashtag Reuters at URI. And feel free, please, but be polite. <laughs> and we might talk about impoliteness online this evening. Um, to, to, to a brief introduction of our speaker tonight, Stephen Adler, because if we went through everything, it would take up half the program. He is president and editor-in-chief of Reuters, which is a global news agency that provides content of all kinds to news outlets all over the world, including the United States. And uh, he has been there since 2010, correct? OK. And uh, under his guidance, Reuters won its first Pulitzer Prize in 2014, and then a, a second in 2016. The second was for breaking news photography. The first was for text reporting. I assume that means print reporting, OK, uh, as opposed to texting news. Thank you. OK. Um, prior to that, he was the editor of Business Week magazine for five years. And he, prior to that, spent 16 years at the Wall Street Journal, where teams that he led won three Pulitzer Prizes. So uh, we're in distinguished company tonight for the benefit of the students, OK? Um, 
we, we shouldn't hold this against him. He's a graduate of Harvard College and Harvard Law, but we'll be nice to him anyway, even though Harvard beat the University of Rhode Island's football team recently. <laughs> Fine. OK, so um, Stevens here in large part because Christian Amanpour actually recommended that he um, be the speaker at, the, at this program. And, uh, You've known her for quite some time. Uh, she did so in part because of a memo that he wrote to the staff of Reuters earlier this year. I think the memo said 12 days after the president was inaugurated. And I, without taking up, I hope, too much time, I just want to read a teensy bit from the memo, and then we can talk about why you wrote it and you know, what your objective was. So. The first 12 days of the Trump presidency, and then in parentheses, yes, that's all it's been, has, that, yes, have been memorable for all and especially challenging for us in the news business. It's not every day that a U.S. president calls journalists, quote, among the most dishonest human beings on earth, end quote, or that his chief strategist dubs the media, quote, the opposition party. That would have been a reference to Steve Bannon, yeah? It was Bannon at the time, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's hard to keep up with who's there and who isn't. Uh, it's hardly surprising that the year is thick with questions and theories about how to cover the new administration. So what is the Reuters answer? To oppose the administration, to appease it, to boycott its briefings, to use our platform to rally support for the media? All these ideas are out there, and they might be right for some news operations, but they don't make sense for Reuters. We already know what to do because we do it every day and we do it all over the world. So that's the first two paragraphs of, of that memo. And after I, after I read those two paragraphs, I just said, yes, please. Uh, so there was a lot of um, angst in the media, uh, a lot of confusion in the public mind about what the president was doing right off the bat after he uh, uh, took office. And especially put journalists in a bind about how, how do you cover this? Because if you cover the things he's saying and, you, and he doesn't like what you're saying, then you become a target. So was that the motivation? Is that the reason why you wrote the memo? No, I don't think it was about being worried about being a target. But I, I do want to thank you all for being here. If you were expecting Christiane, I apologize. <laughs> I, I thought Christiane was the speaker, too, so I got confused. Um, no, the purpose of the memo was, uh, I mean, keep in mind that we were all, we had all covered Trump for a while. There had been an entire campaign, and it was very different from any other campaign. Uh, we have a program where we give hostile environment training to our journalists who work in war zones, and, and partway through the campaign, we realized we actually had to give hostile environment training to our journalists covering the Trump rallies, and that, that's true. Uh, because they were being harassed, and continue, by the way, to be harassed when, when they cover uh, those rallies. Yeah. Um, also, we were not in any way familiar uh, in this country with the situation where the press was being uh, treated as, as the enemy of the people, and that was one of the terms that was used. Uh, the press is, is the enemy of the people. And I think there was a lot of um, understand, uh, belief among a lot of the American press, and we're not the American press, by the way, we're a global organization, but there was a belief among a lot of the American press that this was a sort of an existential moment, that press freedom was at risk in a, in a very fundamental way, and that, in fact, freedom in the United States was at risk. And it's no secret that, you know, 95 to 98 percent of the media covering politics is, was, was not pro-Trump. I mean, that, that is a complaint that, that Trump supporters make that is entirely, uh, entirely correct. So, so there was a, a move by a lot of very well-known and respected news organizations essentially to say that the responsibility of the media is to, is to combat this, is to fight uh, the, uh, the administration and to, uh, and, and to actively oppose uh, you know, the, the way in which the, the administration was presenting itself. And I thought it was really important for us to step back and say, well, what do we do? What, what, what's our job? And in my view has always been that um, the, the job of a journalist is to take professional skills. We're not just people who you know, shoot our mouths off. We have professional skills that we learn at places like, like, like here. And 
we use those professional skills to provide information to people so that they can make their own decisions as to how they feel about something, whether it's politically or whether to buy a house or how the mortgages look. Um, but our job essentially is to help facilitate smart decision making. And you need good, accurate, fair, dispassionate information to do that. And that this presidency was no different than anything else. We, we do this everywhere in the world. We cover presidents and, and, and dictators and all sorts of officials who don't like the media. That doesn't mean we walk out of uh, conferences. It don't, doesn't mean that we, we become lobbyists for one side or another. It just means we do our job. We go in there, we try to report, we try to figure out what's going on, and we try to share it with the public. And that's our job here as it is every place else in the world. And that, oddly, seemed very strange to a lot of people because uh, it wasn't what a lot of people were doing. Yes. So can you talk just a, a little bit about the history of Reuters and where the ethic of Reuters came from? And Because a lot of the memo was about that. Yeah. You know, it included do's and don'ts, but they were, uh, all of it was advice about the best way to practice. So can you talk a little bit about the history of, of Reuters? Yeah, and the history of any organization is incredibly important, and, and people do say that culture is probably the most important thing in an organization, and I think that's true of Reuters. Reuters goes back to 1851, founded by a man named Julius Reuter, and over time, uh, and really, re really very quickly, Reuters developed a reputation for doing what used to be called objective reporting, and we can talk about if that means anything, but uh, the goal was to provide information that people in the financial industry and people generally uh, would, would find useful and, and that they would, uh, they would trust. And Reuters takes a lot of pride in the fact that we have covered every single war in the world since the U.S. Civil War from both sides. In other words, we've had access across lines because we've been understood to be a, an honest broker, to, to be a player that, that wasn't taking sides. You can be criticized for that, but on the other hand, think about what you gain. You gain the opportunity to get the perspective of, of everybody um, out there, and uh, you gain the opportunity to find out more than you could find out if you're associated with one side uh, or another. So that history goes way back. In 1941, uh, Reuters faced uh, somewhat of a crisis because uh, Reuters at the time was British-based, and there was a, a real attempt uh, by the British government to uh, essentially em employ Reuters as a propaganda agency for the British against the Germans in World War II. And that would not have been unusual anywhere in the world that a local news organization would be uh, you know, sort of brought in to, to take the side. Uh, but the owners of Reuters, which were the newspapers, there was a consortium of newspapers, didn't want to do that. It wanted to be a, a real news organization that, that looked at things objectively. So they created a set of principles called the Reuters Trust Principles, uh, which essentially require Reuters to be independent and free of bias. And those principles are still in the charter of the company and came along with it into the charter of Thomson Reuters. So it's very important to us uh, culturally. And in fact, our corporate charter requires us uh, to be independent and unbiased. And people who come through Reuters understand it. They like it. It, it gets imbued in their own culture. Um, and it, it gives us an opportunity to work that way without really having to put a lot of pressure on people to do that. So are, are you encouraged by any changes that you see in the way people are consuming news and, and whether, whether they're uh, placing more credibility in journalists than perhaps they might have been uh, earlier on in the president's first term, or term, I should say? Uh, you know, I, I think journalists have never been much loved, and I think we, we, we tend to think the current situation is, is bigger and more different than uh, than perhaps it is. Uh, you know, people tend not to like purveyors of bad news. They tend uh, to, to like to blame somebody when, when bad things are going on. Uh, so, uh, you know, I've been in journalism kind of forever, and uh, nobody's ever liked uh, the newspapers I've worked for, the publications I've worked for. Uh, but the thing that I find so interesting is they subscribe to them, and they use them, and they pay for them. So. Uh, you know how people say uh, everybody hates Congress, but everybody seems to like their own congressman? It, I think it's a little bit like that. People hate the media in general, but they actually seem to rely on the, uh, on the publications and the news services that they use and rely on. Mm -hmm. so, so I think it's a mixed picture. I actually think people largely believe what they read. I, I really do. And you, you see people criticizing, for example, 
the Trump administration criticizes the Washington Post all the time, and then the Washington Post comes out with a story that says something, and the, everybody accepts it immediately as true, yeah. and then starts talking about it as yeah. if it's true. And you, 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 you want to say, wait a minute, I thought you think everything there is made up. But clearly, they don't think everything there is yeah. made up. Right. So, so, I mean, one of the challenges I think that we face is it's very difficult for people to distinguish uh, among news sources right now, and I don't know if you want to end up yeah. wanting to talk oh, about that. Absolutely. But with so many people getting their news on Facebook and Twitter and, and other social media, the, uh, the prevalence of the brands has become much less great. So I know I do it myself, and I'm, you know, I'm a news junkie, and I'm a news professional, but um, I often say during the day, oh, I read this really interesting story. I have no idea where I read it, and you probably have had that same experience. Mm -hmm. That's because I picked it up off. I happen to use Twitter a lot to, to find news, because I think it's a great way to find news from different sources. And, and you read it, and you don't, you don't know where it's from. And it's probably even more, that's probably even more of an issue on, on, fa on Facebook. Mm -hmm. So um, if you don't know where the news is coming from, and you read it, and you tend to believe it, uh, there's a lot of danger in that because a lot of the stuff com coming out there is not accurate and is not well sourced. So I think one of the important things that journalists need to do and that schools need to do is help people understand the difference between something that's credible and something that's not. I think you know, news literacy is an incredibly important issue right now. Just, just help people understand whether something's likely to be well sourced and to be professionally done or whether it's, it's something that's just sort of off, off somebody, top of somebody's head. Yeah, uh, we are going to take questions l a little bit later. So if you have questions about that, or uh, you know, what you could ask Steve, you know, who who other than Reuters do you think is reliable? Whatever you want to ask. And by the way, also I I did see some phones up. If you're taking pictures, you should put them on the hashtag. Right? <laughs> Isn't that the way that's supposed to work? Okay, and just make sure you get my good side, <laughs> whatever that is. <laughs> um, so. Is there anything you'd change about the memo that you wrote now? Have, you had, yeah. have things changed in some fashion, or is the message essentially the same? Do it the way Reuters has always done it. Yeah, no, there's nothing I would change in the memo. Okay. It's, um, and, and I think nothing really has, has changed that would affect how you would do journalism. Um, you, you see, I mean, the interesting thing that's going on in the, in the news business is that um, it, it's so polarized now, so, so people are you know, either very anti-Trump or they're very pro-Trump. Mm -hmm. um, even what you would have considered mainstream news organizations, uh, I mean, there's, there's implicit bias uh, throughout. And the question that comes up a lot is, uh, you know, and you get goaded by your, by your fellow uh, journalists, you know, wh why, for example, why won't you call Trump a liar? Yeah. Trump is a liar. Why won't you call him a liar? And that's the kind of conversation that goes on in at sort of at journal at meetings of of editors of, from different publications. And you know, our answer to that is we we publish um, everything we know and nothing that we don't know. So if I know that somebody's lying, then I have no problem publishing it. I, I have a single standard. My standard isn't do I use the word liar or not. My standard is I publish only things I know. So do I know the motivation of somebody when they say something that's untrue? Um, no, it, sometimes it's possible I do. It's possible somebody's testified in court uh, or you have them on tape saying, okay, now I'm going to intentionally lie. And then you see him lying and, you, and so then you might say he admitted to lying. But otherwise you have to get into somebody's head and understand their motivation to use the word lie. So we'd be more likely to say that somebody said something that and there was no evidence for it or said something but the evidence opposed it rather than use a word like lie. So I, I think the consistency of our, of our view makes it very, first of all, it's much simpler for our journalists to figure out what to do. We, we don't have a lot of crises or conflicts over, you know, can we publish that, can we say that, because we have the same standard. We report everything we know that's relevant to the public and report nothing that we don't know. It's the same with rumors. Uh, a, a lot of publications feel as if it's okay if somebody put, puts out an undocumented dossier against somebody. Uh, they, they think it's okay just to publish that because you know, we, live, we live in the age of transparency and you just put out everything. Yeah. But again, I go back to our core principles. We're journalists. We, get, we hear lots of rumors. People, people bring things to newsrooms all the time. And by definition, if they're not true, you don't publish them. You publish them when they're true, when, when, you've, when you've proven them to be true. So if somebody accuses somebody of something horrible, um, you, you look into it if it looks like it might be relevant. And if you discover it's not true, 
uh, you don't publish the rumor. But these days, a lot of people are just saying, well, every, you know, I've, I've seen it as a journalist, so why shouldn't everybody see it? Well, the reason is we are actually professionals in the business of trying to sort out what's accurate and what isn't and, and not repeat uh, you know, libelous or false statements, but actually try to find out what's true. I, I do think that some journalists are struggling over this question of whether to call the president a liar as opposed to maybe just trying to prove that something he said is not true, or if it is true, that it's true. So uh, one of the things I would recommend to students is that you go to the Reuters website, simplereuters.com, and look at what they do. Uh, in particular, because we are talking a lot about the president, in, in particular, I'd recommend that you look at uh, uh, the work that you're doing under, the ban under a banner called the Trump Effect. Right. Uh, so it's a different approach than a lot of other news outlets are taking to reporting about Donald Trump. Right. You're not necessarily reporting about his tweets. Right. You don't have any trouble finding out about those. So can you explain sure. to, the, to, to the audience what the Trump effect is all about? Right. So, so one of our struggles when we were thinking about how we we're going to cover tr Trump is there is what passes for news out there every day. Uh, there's a statement, there's a tweet, there's an argument, there's something going on inside uh, the White House. Everybody gets all excited about something. And when the dust clears, that thing had no actual impact on any human being out in the country. It was just one of those things that everybody got excited about. And there's so much of that now. It's just the, it's, it's the, the news is, is overloaded with it. So we were asking ourselves, well, is there a way we can think about covering this administration where, while maybe sometimes some of that was newsworthy, so the question of whether uh, of, of the president's response to NFL players uh, kneeling during the anthem. There's definitely something sociologically important about that, so I'm not saying it's not important. But what's most important to people, we thought, uh, was how, it how it's actually going to affect their lives in a significant way. People voted because middle class people didn't have the jobs or the kinds of jobs uh, that they wanted. Uh, people cared about immigration. They were worried that immigrants were, they were either worried about immig that immigrants were taking their jobs or they were very devoted to immigration and, and they wanted to protect it. Um, they cared about the environment and worried about global warming or they thought that growth was more important. But they cared about things out there. They cared about taxes. They, they either thought they were too high or they didn't. Um, and it struck us there wasn't enough coverage of the, of the ne nexus between the policy and then what actually happened? Did, did the number of immigrants go down? Did uh, the number of jobs go up? Um, are more pipelines being opened up or not? Are more offshore oil drilling rigs being opened up? So the, what the Trump effect is, it's kind of a, it's a section or almost like a microsite on Reuters.com, which uh, you can reach by Reuters.com slash Trump data dot effect, although you'll see it because it's usually on the home page. And what it simply does is it links policies to actual consequences. And that there's two advantages to that. It gives you some place to go if you're saying to yourself, what, what ended up happening with the wall? Well, it tells you everything that's happened with the wall. Or what ended up happening with, didn't the president say that um, mothers were going to be separated from children if they illegally immigrated? Did that happen? And it, did that cut down on, on immigration of mothers with children? So we're trying to track the statement or the action uh, to the effect uh, consistently. So. It enables you to do that, but it also disciplines our reporting. It was a way of guiding ourselves to, to, to look for stories that were based on effects and not just based on noise. So minimize the noise and focus on the substance, which is what we think our, our mission is anyway. So I, 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 I've been hearing a lot of people just, just saying, I'm, I'm sick of the news. It, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, some of that is what you were talking about earlier, is that so much of the news is bad news. But I think it might actually go deeper. How can or, uh, organizations like yours drive people more to the kind of reporting that you're doing, where you're looking at consequences? So for, for instance, one of the pieces that I, that I read recently um, had to do with uh, deregulation. And we've heard a lot about removing this regulation or that regulation, especially environmental regulations. Um, but not a lot of reporting about the consequences of, of that. But you did that. So I guess part, partly, I guess what I'm asking is, um, how does Reuters, that 
you know, an organization that does it right, drive people more to not, maybe not even just your uh, reporting, but other people who do reporting the way you think it should be done? Yeah, it's tough. You can't make people read what they don't want to read or look at what, mm. the, what they don't want to look at. Um, Reuters is a little different from other news organizations that many of you are familiar with because we're a news agency. So we've got about 3,500 news organizations subscribed to the Reuters service um, all around the world. And they essentially buy the news from us. And because our customers are businesses, our, our news organizations, as well as financial organizations, um, they're looking for something. The organizations want a good, reliable flow of news that will round out their, uh, their news contribution. So perhaps a local paper can cover its own local news, but doesn't have the capability of covering international news. So we, we fill that out for it. And then it chooses to use whatever it wants to use. So in a sense, we're getting paid to fill in all the gaps and to provide a very wide range of news, not all of which our customers are necessarily uh, going to use. So that gives us an advantage and because our customer base wants, wants what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Now, how you, how you get the general public to want you know, to eat their vegetables or, or, or eat yeah. their spinach um, is a question that everybody in the news business has been asking mm -hmm. kind of forever. And um, you know, I think a lot of people are experimenting with um, other ways of storytelling, and there are a lot of good. We're doing as, uh, a lot of it, but there are also a lot of good uh, organizations, you know, aimed more particularly at younger people who may consume differently. Uh, you know, I think of Mike, I think of Vice, I think of Vox, um, who are uh, using a lot more visuals uh, and also kind of mashing up visuals with text with, with very interesting interactive graphics. The goal being making, making the presentation more appealing. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, you can even do things with Instagram. I mean, there, there's things you can do to, to make, make news more appealing. And it's not exactly dumbing it down. It's more um, you know, ma making it uh, feel more like the, the types of things people want to consume. Yeah. So I think, uh, you know, j journalism organizations do have a lot of responsibility to deliver news in a way that's interesting and palatable. That said, uh, there is a big appetite for the most salacious stuff kind of period, because that's human nature. I mean, people like, you know, reading about sex, they like, like reading about crimes. And I think we're in a place in the, uh, in the news business, unfortunately, where enough news organizations are having enough trouble financially, it's very difficult to turn away from uh, covering things that get you a lot of clicks. And, and if you're suffering financially and you can do something that gets more people to watch it and you get more advertising and you make more money, uh, it's tremendously tempting. It's very difficult to, to get people to work against their financial interests. So, you know, this is going to be an ongoing issue. Yeah. So. Uh, along those lines, everybody kind of has a, a vague idea of what might save journalism. Mm -hmm. You know, what, what's the funding mechanism going to be? What's the business plan? Um, but nobody really has an answer. Nobody seems to have come up with an answer yet. Do you subscribe to like foundation support? Could you ever see Reuters going to foundations and say, you know, we're doing something really important here? It would be great if you could give us a few million dollars. Is that a direction to go, or do you, you know, are you looking maybe at other at other possibilities? Not necessarily for Reuters, right? But sure. Journalism in general. Right. So there's pluses and minuses to every business model. If you go the foundation route, you're reliant on a funder, and that funder might be independent, but the funders usually have an agenda. There's usually something they would like you to focus on. So you lose some independence yeah. when, when you go to foundations. Even a do-gooder foundation wants you to spend more time focusing on rainforests or more time yeah. focusing on income inequality. There's nothing wrong with that, but it, what it does is it kind of steers your news judgment towards particular topics. Um, big movement towards trying to get people to pay for content. Uh, the news has largely been free on the web. Probably the single biggest mistake the news industry ever made, um, perhaps any, any industry ever made, yeah. was uh, somehow deciding that all information wanted to be free. And uh, you know, I don't know why that's true. Um, <laughs> but in the kind of early mid-90s, the people who were considered the trendsetters and the real smart people in the industry said uh, news should be free. And then when people like Google came along, uh, so much the better because Google would spread it to more people. But when you think about it, it costs a lot of money 
to gather news, uh, to curate it, to edit it, to do it well. Um, if it's something of use to people, people generally pay for things of use. They pay for, they pay for movies, they, they, they pay for lots of things that, that they think are important. Um, but once you let that cat out of the bag and you said it was all free, um, and then you discovered seven years later that your business model was falling apart and having news free was just killing you and killing the industry, it was very hard to pull that back. And a lot of people have been trying to and, 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 and setting up uh, uh, payment systems and micropayment systems, not working great for most people, but it is a model. So what are the models? Uh, there's foundation funding, uh, there's uh, paywalls, and relying more on that. And a lot of news organizations are trying to do more than just provide news. They're trying to create events, so they're sort of surrounding the news with other things. And there are news organizations that are making decent money on events. The Atlantic, which owns the magazine, and the website, I think, makes a very significant percentage of their money on events. They've just figured out a way to do that very well. So news organizations are looking at that. Um, and um, there's models where people are partnering more with each other. So they're, um, they're taking advantage of each other's skills. There's a big kind of move towards consortia, reporting consortia, where 10 or 12 news organizations will work together. So that obviously um, helps you with your costs. Um, but, that, but that kind uh, of thing yeah. was historically in the United States, as, as far as I know, yeah. that kind of thing was, you know, not forbidden, but frowned upon. I mean, even if you look at the Rhode Island as a mi microcosm, the, the news outlets in Rhode Island would never agree yeah. to work together. And, and technically, you know, in a lot of ways, they don't now. Uh, uh, the journal wouldn't partner up with anybody, but now some of them are. The, some of the TV yeah. stations are partnering uh, with with uh, newspapers or radio stations, um, so the other the other option I was going to mention, of course, is that you could go to Jeff Bezos and ask him to buy you as well. But you know, they, but isn't there a danger if Amazon and Google and Facebook start buying up news outlets? Yeah, yeah. No, I mean it, the history of the news business in this country is not that long in history because the country isn't that old. But we certainly had a period of press magnets like the Hearst who, who were using newspapers and, and some, pe some people would say Murdoch, uh, using newspapers in part to um, you know, be, be part of it, a way to be influential and, and to, to have their, their viewpoints seen. And there's, there's risks to that as well. I think Bezos so far is not, doesn't seem to be you know, injecting any p particular political uh, focus into it, but uh, you know, as a, you know, I, I guess as sort of a, somebody who has a lot of symp sympathy for capitalism, I would say, I, I prefer a system where uh, news organizations can find a business model that they can stand on their feet, because the independence of that, I think, uh, you know, gives you a lot of freedom uh, to, to do the work properly. I want people to, one way or another, to pay for the news and to understand its value. Um, and to uh, rely on us to provide news that matters to them. And I, th I think that's a really good model. Um, you know, I, I can see things that could happen that would make news more profitable over time. Uh, you can see some more consolidation. Uh, maybe there are too many news organizations out there, mm -hmm. and we'd be just as well served by having fewer. Um, but I do think the big crisis in journalism is at the local level, not at the national or, or global level. There's too many local publications are going out of business. It's too hard to sustain them. And I think um, even this last campaign has caused people to uh, uh, open their eyes a little bit about that. If there was a feeling that people didn't really understand what was happening on the ground in local communities and why people were so dissatisfied with most of the establishment politicians, maybe it was partly because you did, no longer had a lot of robust Local journalism out there because those their publications went out of business. So, so I think that's a big a big problem. I I, I raise this question with a, a little bit of trepidation, but not much because earlier we were talking about local TV news. Yeah. And a lot of the time when people say to me, "Well, I'm done with the news," that's what they're done with. Um, because they, they're local, they should be covering these kinds of local issues that are of real import to people in communities, but they don't seem to do it. Is it just because they're businesses and have to make a profit and they're appealing to what they think the majority of people are attracted to? 
Is, do, or do, maybe I'm wrong about it, but do you see, I don't know how much local TV you watch, but do you see local TV stations covering serious community issues a good deal of the time? I think they do some, some of that. Yeah. I, I think crime and, and weather are hmm. very big. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and you see a lot of that. You know, and I've, I've thought about it. It's, it's um, I mean, I think people kind of get what they, uh, I, I think if over time, local stations have tended towards doing the really sort of superficial and, and um, more salacious stuff, it's because that's what gets the ratings. Be, because you often hear people say, you know, that the television news is, speaks beneath the public and if only somebody took it seriously. But lots of people who went out there to take it seriously went out of business pretty quickly. Yeah. That, that they, I think we're always at war with, with ourselves, you know, our sort of our appetites are hungry for the salacious stuff and we kind of know we should be interested in the more serious stuff. Yeah. Um, but the ratings do better when, when you get the, um, you know, the, the fires and, and the crimes. Um, you know, there are, there are opportunities for alternatives. I mean, just to put a more of a bright light on it, since the advent of, of the internet and social media, everybody's a publisher. There are lots of independent voices out there. Somebody who, people do really interesting things on Medium and, and uh, on Twitter that are their own. Um, you know, people talk about how the, the debasement of the news business because of social media and, and because of you know, the internet and how much bad information is out there. But I would counter that more people have access to more of the world's knowledge than ever in the history of the world. That you can sit there at your computer and learn almost anything there is to learn. And if you're any good at distinguishing sources and understand what's a reliable source and what isn't, what's available to you, if you're sitting in a little village in India or you're sitting you know, right here in Rhode Island, is you know basically the whole history of knowledge all there on your little computer. So that's a very positive thing, um, in addition to some of the negative trends we see. So let's talk about some of the negative trends we see. So uh, uh, again, well, you're just we, going for ratings. Like yeah, I, I am yeah. absolutely. I want people to hate me. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, again, this week we saw, uh, unfortunately, an incident that got reported incorrectly uh, a lot early wrong information about everything from the weapon reuse to who actually did the shooting and whether the, sh whether the shooter was a member of ISIS or right. was some, you know, attached to some other fanatical group or whatever it was. And I, I, I want to get to the social media aspect of this because this social media tends to compound bad information or misinformation. But, uh, <laughs> Our, our television media, because it's largely television, but it's also online now, are they ever going to stop doing this, rushing to get information out that they don't know is true? Is there a cure for that? You know, I, no, I don't think there's a cure for it. I, I think, I mean, I've thought a lot about, so what, what, what's our responsibility to the broader uh, system? What can we do to help, it, help other people not make those kinds of mistakes? And, yeah. and what I usually come back to is, we should do everything we can not to make those kinds of mistakes mm -hmm. because I think it starts at home. So having, having the right systems in place that say wait to confirm things, don't just put it out there because somebody said it, don't repeat any rumor that's out there, um, you know, I think is the right, the right approach and hoping that people will, will want to turn towards more reliable sources uh, to, to find out what's going on. But, even if traditional news organizations didn't publish that stuff, it would be all over the internet and all over Twitter, and you couldn't keep it out, and those rumors would, would be out there. There have always been those rumors, but now we have this huge megaphone of social media uh, to, to spread it. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, we should be critical of news organizations that put out misinformation. Yeah. Uh, People should shine a spotlight on it, as people do. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there should be some shaming involved in, yeah. in doing that. But ultimately, each news organization has to say to itself, um, you know, we're going to be really careful, mm -hmm. and we're going to be self-reflective if we make mistakes. And I mean, that's what we try to do. I mean, it goes to the, back to the question, a lot of news organizations were asked to participate in a fact-checking uh, program that Facebook created about a year ago. And lots of news organizations participated because what would happen is when a Facebook post was challenged on, on the facts, the Facebook would send 
send it to somebody who's part of this fact-checking group, and those were largely other news organizations, and the fact-checkers would come back and say that th this is essentially not a legitimate news organization or this was, this was clearly not based in facts. Um, and what was discovered was the stories that were flagged as having these questions attached to them got more usage than the stories that, that weren't flagged. Now, we didn't participate in it, not because we expected that to happen, although it's an interesting piece of data, mm. um, but we didn't participate because we thought that you know, one set of organizations judging another set of organizations was going to set up a, ultimately sort of a left-right problem, which is most of the things being challenged were going to be from the far-right um, websites, and it was going to be mainstream media organizations that are often perceived as being more progressive doing the judging, and that that wasn't going to get you anywhere. That, that just was not going to yeah. create a, a useful system. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what I'd say is push news literacy, try to get people to understand the difference between sources, and yeah. try to do the right kind of work yourself. Yeah. So, uh, we've heard a tremendous amount all of this year, and, and, and actually going back to maybe mid-2016 about fake news. Yeah. But I find even sometimes with students in classes that they're not 100% certain what fake news is. Yeah. Part of that might be because some folks, including the president, refer to news reports that they think are inaccurate as fake. Yeah. Or he just calls something fake because it's critical of him. Right. So I think there's probably a simple working definition of fake news. But if you had to define it, yeah. what, how would you define it? Well, I, I would try to uh, define it out of existence. I don't, I don't think it's a, I don't think it's a useful term. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's gotten yeah. it's gotten ridiculous. Everybody just accuses each other. It's you know, it's, yeah. it's just a curse word at this mm. point. Um, you know, I mean, to me, it's fake news if it's not really a news organization trying to get at the, get at the facts. It's not fake news if it's highly opinionated, mm -hmm. highly opinionated news that takes the facts and uses them for a view. To me, that's that's opinion journalism. Yeah. And you know, fake news would probably be an organization that isn't really a news organization that's just out there proliferating. Yep. Um, you know, like like the Russians have been accused of uh, just proliferating things to cause trouble. Yeah. Um, but it, it's become a, a, a damaging term because it's simply a, you know, something that you, people accuse each other of. So it's it's more useful to say, you know, I don't think your story is accurate for the following reasons yep. than just to point a finger and call it fake news. Mm -hmm. And I'm hoping that the terminology goes out of business. Yeah, that would be nice. In the old days, they used to call that fabrication, just making stuff up. Yeah. And it's a serious ethical violation. People lose their jobs for it. But now, it's, it, you're right. It's, it, people are referring to it as fake news. I'm not sure that they even have a good idea what that means. But uh, unfortunately, uh, during the campaign, uh, a young man with a journalism degree uh, put out a story uh, which he made up this business about uh, uh, ballot boxes in Ohio being stuffed uh, with Clinton ballots. Mm -hmm. and, and it might actually have had some effect on the election. Maybe it didn't. But he, it, social media is what carried that story. It, uh, what, how do people guard themselves against that kind of thing? And when they're, you know, they, if they see it, is there a way for them to check whether it's true. If they see it on Facebook or a friend shares it with them or whatever, is there a way that they can check it to, to see if it's true? Well, you know, you would just go, as you would do when you're, when you're doing a research paper, you'd go to multiple sources. You'd, if you see something in an encyclopedia, you'd check, you'd go back to primary sources. Mm -hmm. um, if, if you're seeing it in, some, in a publication that you never heard of, you'd see if you're finding it elsewhere in places that you thought were reputable. It's trying to understand the difference between a reputable source and, and one that isn't. Yeah. Any, anybody who wants to try hard to figure out if something's accurate uh, on the web can do that. It's just a question of whether they want to find out and yeah. how, hard, yeah. how hard they're I, willing to try. It's work. Um, you got to work at it. Yeah, you know, you yeah. don't have to work at it. But you know, there, there is this question, which I don't have an easy answer for. But uh, take, I mean, Facebook has taken the position that it's just a platform. It's a conduit for other people's information. Um, it isn't a news provider. It isn't a news organization. Therefore, it's not responsible uh, for the accuracy or quality of what's on it. Um, that view is deteriorating. People are not accepting it. Governments aren't accepting it. I think the public's getting frustrated with it. And Facebook is trying and increasingly trying to do something to screen out 
um, you know, news that's clearly, clearly fake to, uh, you know, to be aware uh, of what's going on there. So I think there is work that the platforms can do. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's a general feeling that they have to take some more responsibility for the fact that they're the main way that uh, you know, misinformation is now being uh, transmitted in the society. Mm -hmm. So uh, one other thing along those lines, and then I want to talk a little bit, or have you talk a little bit about the importance of international news. Um, y your organization disallowed comments online, com com post people to post comments after stories online several years ago. I'm not sure how long yeah, ago it was. Yeah, two or three years ago. Yeah. Okay. Um, and a lot of other news organizations have also stopped doing that. Some still allow it. Why, why did you do that? And uh, were you having problems with comments that people were, were making? Yeah, I mean, there's a couple of reasons. Well, one is so much of the commentary is abusive and uh, non-constructive. And, um, and because it's sitting on your side, you have some responsibility for, for that content. Nobody's got the staff size to monitor the number of comments that come in. And you know, financially, it made no sense at all to devote that high a percentage of the staff just to monitor comments and get rid of ones that were libelous, ad hominem, nasty, abusive comments. Um, it didn't seem that the comment section had become a, an interesting way people exchanged ideas. It just become a way people flamed each other. Um, and I think fairly crucially, when comment sections started online, there was no social media, so people didn't have other ways to talk to each other. And we figured, you know, people want to comment on, on our stories. We're posting our stories on Twitter anyway. They can comment on Twitter. At least we're not hosting that, and we're not having to monitor it. Sort yeah. of it kind of becomes more Twitter's issue. Um, but there were lots of places people can talk about stories, Facebook, Twitter being two of them. So we didn't think we were taking away an important forum. Um, but we didn't think it was a constructive uh, community. Did you get any pushback from people saying you were bridging their free speech? Almost none. It was amazing how little. And it, it's, I mean, there are people, uh, people go back and forth on it, but a lot of people were taking comments down at, at that point. Okay, do, just change up a little bit, and then we can get to some yep. questions. Um, obviously, you're a global news agency. You're reporting about things that are going on all over the world. Uh, <laughs> American audiences might not be that up on international news. Mm -hmm. Maybe some folks are. I, you know, when I ask students, do you pay any attention to news about you know, countries in Africa or Asia or wherever, and, and the ones who say yes, they, they, say, they tell me they listen to or watch the BBC or NPR. So uh, what is the importance for American audiences being aware of what's going on in other parts of the world other than perhaps war zones, because we do get war news. Well, we can, you can see right now how interrelated uh, the world is and how much we're affected by things going on elsewhere. So beyond the fact that it's, I think it's useful for an educated person to be informed about things going on elsewhere, uh, you kind of want to know what's going on in North Korea because you, know, you could see some bombs coming in your direction. You might want to know what's going on. Um, China is incredibly important to our economy and to, to the future of jobs and uh, you know, all of our jobs you know, depend in part on the, the, um, the supply chain and the, the relationships between manufacturing and, and supplies in, in China. Um, but all over the world, um, you know, we, we have a lot of cultural ties with Europe and, and with Britain. Um, the, uh, the struggles they're having, uh, Britain is having, uh, getting out of the European Union is both going to affect um, trade relationships with the United States, but it's also going to affect um, just what it, what it turns out to be like to, to live and travel uh, in Europe. I, I strongly, by the way, and an ad for ourselves, we have a website called uh, Reuters.com. It's very international in focus. We have a, an app which you can download from, uh, onto your iPhone which is very easy to use. And we have a great TV app called Reuters TV, which again, you can download from the Apple Store or from any, any phone. Any, uh, also, it, it exists on pretty much every platform. And you can get it on, on the internet if you just go to www.reuters.tv. And, and it's a very international news show. If, if you compare it to the um, national news shows in the US, you're gonna get way more stories 
of things going on around the world. And they're interesting. It's interesting to see what's going on around the world. So we're covering you know, major food shortages in Africa that people probably don't know about, the uh, struggles of the Rohingya uh, Muslims in uh, Myanmar. Uh, we probably, you know, there were 22 uh, people trampled to death in a uh, Mumbai uh, train station two or three days ago. Um, that's more people, I believe, than were killed in the high-rise fire in Britain and the amount of coverage the yeah. uh, Mumbai uh, incident had was tiny, even in you know, excellent newspapers, it was at the bottom of a inner inside page, but you get a better sense of the texture and the fabric of the world if you're, if you're looking at international news and you're also seeing how we as a country fit into that. How are we perceived? How do we interrelate? How do we trade with other people? What do they think of us? So I, I think it's really valuable. So uh, you might get a, a question on this, but I, I just want to make sure. Can you offer some quick or simple advice sure. to journalism majors about how they can best prepare themselves to practice? Sure. Well, I mean, it, when I think about what are, the, you know, what are the attributes you really need, particularly in this environment, which is a tougher business environment than your previous generation grew up in, um, you have to really want to do it. Uh, you, uh, you know, I think curiosity is, is probably the key um, element to be an excellent journalist. And you really can see the difference in people. Some people, they want to do the minimum number of interviews to get the story. Um, but I think the best journalists are people who just, just really want to get to the bottom of it. They really want to know what it's about. And, and I think that's, that's crucial and, and has turned out to be, to be uh, the big differentiator. Um, the other thing I learned early on, uh, and by the way, it's very useful to have a mentor, so a recommendation I'd have is find yourself a mentor, mm -hmm. somebody who has done it and can help you. Um, but one thing that I think stuck with me from an early mentor, uh, because it wasn't familiar to me, he said, uh, no is the beginning of the conversation, not the end of the conversation. So as a journalist, you should expect somebody to say, no, I don't want to talk to you. That's, that's how you start the conversation. It's not how you end the conversation. So you go, OK, fine. You don't want to talk to me. And then you figure out a way to get the information. So I always found that, that incredibly useful. Um, I, the, the other thing that, I, that has stuck with me, and I think something I just kind of learned on my own, because I had a, let's say, a, a more introverted personality than some other journalists, was that you really, um, to, be, to be a really good journalist, you really actually have to be yourself and that the best reporting style is an authentic style. So there are some people who are bombastic and are loud, some people who tell jokes, some people who sort of insinuate themselves uh, in, into the conversation. Um, there's all sorts of different styles, but uh, what really works is connecting with people authentically the way you connect with people. So the great thing about it is you don't have to change your personality. You don't have to you know, be, be Woodward or Bernstein or whoever your, you know, your role model is, just, just but bring yourself to it and bring your whole self to it, um, and, and you can be very successful. Great. Listen, I, I, before we take questions, I just want to, again, thank you for uh, coming here to the, tonight. You're a pretty busy guy. Well, that's and to take time out to, to, in particular, to talk to students, I think, is, is uh, really a gift to all. Well, I love talking to students, and I, I thank you, everybody, for your attention. Appreciate your being here. <laughs> So and. Adam has a microphone. Let me just check the time, because you have to leave at 8.15? Yep. OK, so we've got about 20 minutes if you have questions. Um, Adam Roth has the microphone, and we can get it to you. So yeah, sir, you had your hand up first. Hi. Um, Hi. You talked about social media a little bit, but I was curious how the way people get their news now, how has that changed your role um, since starting at Reuters? Right. So, so the question is, uh, how has the way the changes in how people get the news changed um, our role at, at Reuters? Um, well, because so many people are getting their news on Facebook in particular and, uh, and through Google, you, you obviously have to be aware um, and, and through digital sites as opposed to newspapers and uh, you know, more traditional means. You have to be aware of what formats are really of interest. So we went from having very separate what we call text or print mm -hmm. um, 
uh, teams and separate video teams and separate print teams to bringing those together so that we could deliver in a more multimedia format. And because that's what gets stickiness online, and that's what gets what pe people to read the news on, on Facebook. So, um, you know, so the multi, so we're, learning, we're teaching everybody multiple skills so that somebody who goes out to report a story can also take a picture and, and shoot a little video. And so I think that's actually been the biggest change. Okay. Other questions? Yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, so thank you so much for coming. This is really um, awesome to hear you talk about all this stuff. But I was curious, I have two questions for you. One, um, how do you cover issues where one side, or if you're trying to be unbiased, where one side has been scientifically disproven, right. like climate change, for yeah. instance? Right. Um, so yeah. Great question, yeah. So, so objectivity to me does not mean false equivalency. So it doesn't mean you simply dispassionately say, well, these people say the Earth is flat, and these people say the Earth is round, so reach your own conclusion. That's not what I mean. Um, I, I mean um, bringing actual knowledge and insight into the story, but not bringing your personal opinion into the story. And I think there's a difference. So if you cite reputable science, and you say there are some people who disagree, um, but it's a minority of scientists, or that, or you, you just be very specific about who the sources are and what their, their credentials are. And that's how you probably would handle that. Uh, not every issue is a 50-50 issue. And a, a dispassionate, objective journalist doesn't treat it like a 50-50 issue. So for example, um, just to go back to something that was talked about a lot, Reuters took a picture from the top of the Washington Monument of the Obama inauguration at 3.30 in the afternoon. They took a picture, we took a picture from the top of the Washington Monument at about the same time at, at Trump's inauguration. You can compare those two pictures. I can tell you that those pictures were not doctored, that those were the actual pictures. We're not a conspiracy organization. We just try to get the facts out. There were way more people in one picture than the other. We would both show that and we would say that. So it wasn't fake news. And yeah. it's, uh, some things are just factual. <laughs> yeah, That's not yeah. calling anybody any names. And it's not calling um, uh, Sean Spicer a liar for saying that one's more than the other. It's showing, it's showing the facts. Sorry, just one more question. I do have an issue on a very micro scale, but what's it like to be janitor-in-chief of Chile? What's your day like? That's a good question. Why not I think of that? All right. What's my day like? Um, it, it's, every day is so different that uh, it's very difficult to, uh, to say. I did a blog for my staff saying, how do I spend my day? Because they have the same question. <laughs> they have the same question you do. Um, yeah. There's a lot of crisis management. Things, just a lot of things go wrong. You've got 3,000 people out there doing things. Sometimes they get in trouble through no fault of their own. We've had people killed. We've had people arrested. We've had people beaten up. Uh, we've had people kicked out of countries. Um, and we've had people do things they shouldn't have done. So one way or another, the big stuff comes to me. Um, sometimes we get accused of things we didn't do. We were accused of once of pulling the plug off a live appearance of then-candidate Trump at a church, be, presumably because we didn't like him. And we got inundated. We just got, um, it, it was the worst attack of social media and emails I'd ever seen. For And, and we hadn't done it. So it's not that we did it, but we didn't mean it. It's, we hadn't done it. It wasn't us. We weren't anywhere near the place. So, so I, you know, that took a couple of days to fix. So, the, so there's crisis management. There's trying to set general strategy. Uh, there's dealing with the most sensitive stories. So I try to, you know, read something that if I know it's going to be truly, truly explosive. Um, there's meeting with the people who report to me because a big part of a leadership job is managing the people who are actually doing the work. So you know, the leader has to pick really great people to do each thing and let them do it, but also connect with them and make sure it's being done well, has to, when, when there are vacancies, has to pick good people, uh, has to make public appearances like this because it's important to project the brand and to communicate with people, so I, I do that as well. Um, and I, I, I handle the budget. It's budget season. We're working on next year's budget. That's, that's never a, an enjoyable process, so there's a lot of budget meetings to try to figure out uh, where we're going with that. Um, and I'm just trying to think what else I did today. Um, <laughs> and, um, you know, I do a lot of interviews. Uh, so I, I did like four uh, interviews with prominent people in the last two weeks. Uh, two of them were heads of state. 
And so I have to prepare a lot for that. So I do a lot of studying, which I love. And I travel quite a lot I, to visit bureaus. And so that's just a, a glimpse. Thank you. So it's fun. It's really fun. Yeah. Many years ago, I could turn on the TV and depend on Walter Cronkite to give me the truth. Today I turn on the TV or I read the paper or listen to the radio and I have lots of questions about you know, what is real and what, and what is not. It's very frustrating. Any thoughts? Well, I mean, a couple of things. One is um, I, I think there was a version of the truth you got from Walter Cronkite, but it was, it was and that type, but it was a pretty, you know, just to be honest, a pretty white male establishment version of, of the truth. I think we live in a much more complicated place where there are you know, other ways of looking at things and that a, a single um, authoritative voice is not necessarily, we don't trust that there, be, there is a single authoritative voice and there are always white males um, to tell us you know, what, what the facts are. So I just think we live in a, you know, a, a world where there's, there's more perspectives on, on what's going on. Um, so I don't think that's all bad. Um, but I also think that um, because more people have access to, uh, to, to, you know, a billion people are publishers now, you do get a lot of people who have no sense of responsibility whatsoever. So there's, there is a lot more negative, a lot more noise. So I, I think there are pluses and minuses. But I, I think we may over idealize that period when we had those three, you know, um, distinguished. Uh, people telling us what the news were. We missed a lot of things uh, during that period. Things, and by the way, they didn't tell us things that we now believe we have a right to know uh, that they kept secret because they were sort of part of the elite. Uh, you know, they hung out with the Kennedys. They didn't necessarily tell you about some of the stuff the Kennedys were doing. So, plus, I, I see pluses and minuses. In the back, uh, I just want to start off by saying a great presentation right there. Um, I just have a question about. Um, in the, you touched in your, pre, in your presentation about uh, in the modern day how a lot of millennials are getting their news from various sources. Uh, what has Reuters specifically done to try and capture like millennials' attention? To capture what? I'm sorry. To capture like the attention of mil the millennials. 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 Yeah, yeah. Um, well, we have done some things. I, I, I think it's a challenge for us. We created Reuters TV, which is what they call an over-the-top, meaning you get it directly on your phone, uh, television service. Uh, we're doing a lot more video than we were doing before, and, and that has tends to be something uh, millennials prefer. And we're doing a lot more multimedia infographics. Um, so, you know, our hope is to reach a broader, uh, a broader segment. But I think there are brand issues. So, for example, there are startup brands that come up that are, that are staffed with millennials, that are founded by millennials, that you know are sort of in the zeitgeist a little more. And I think they have certain advantages. And um, you know, it's a it's a bit more of a struggle for an established organization, whether it's a New York Times or a Reuters or an AP or a Washington Post, to have quite that you know bead on that age group, particularly since we're trying to serve across age groups. And you know, it's not like I like a lot of them. I think Mike does a really good job. And, and you see interesting things on Vox and Vice. BuzzFeed has a good news team. Um, I think there's room for a lot of different organizations. I'm not somebody who thinks everybody should do it the way we do it. But I think for our business, which is selling news to other news organizations, we have about the right, you know, we do it about the right way. I think we've got time for two more. We've got one in the back, and then we can come up front again, maybe. OK. What, what is the viability of an agency like Reuters today, uh, particularly in terms of the number of reporters you have now versus like five and 10 years ago, and also the number of reporters that you have working long form uh, investigative type journalism? Well, we have a lot more doing long form investigative journalism than we did before I started in this role because I, I was investigative editor at the Wall Street Journal. I care a lot about it. And I do think it's an important part of the mix of what we do. So we have about 30 people devoted specifically to doing that. And they partner with other people on the staff. So we actually do a lot of, uh, a lot of investigative journalism. Uh, we have somewhat fewer people than we had 10 years ago. Uh, we still have more people than anybody else has. Um, I, I think what it's caused us to do is to think hard about what we really needed to cover and what we didn't need to cover. I don't think we've gotten worse as we've gotten smaller. 
Um, I, th I think we've just tried, had to be a little more precise. Um, I think a lot of news organizations, but a lot of news organizations do things because they've always done them. And as long as the money's pouring in, I think organizations don't pay a lot of attention to uh, you know, how efficient they are. And as the money gets tighter, you do. Uh, there's a limit to that. Uh, you know, you, you, um, we're in 200 locations around the world. We think that's important. Um, and so there's a point at which you start uh, degrading your, your staff. I don't think we've done that yet, but um, that is a challenge a lot of news organizations face. Um, but um, we're still trying to do a, a very wide range of journalism and co pretty much cover everything that matters in the world. Do we have some? Oh, okay. He's got it. Hi. Hi. Um, so you guys were talking about rushing the news and how you guys kind of at Reuters fill in the gaps for a lot of different news outlets. So how important is it to be first? And what is, how is that difficult for you now, now that there's so many different news outlets that are providing, say, fake news? Well, you have to be first and right. So I, when you first did wrong, I call that a permanent exclusive because nobody else is ever going to pick it up because <laughs> it's wrong. Um, so, so, so we try to be first and right, and we, and we, have, a few, we have some mechanisms for that. We have very, very fast um, tools to, to gather news and to distribute it really quickly. Um, we've created a tool called Tracer, which algorithmically finds things on social media, particularly Twitter, um, and aggregates them. And when it looks like it's identifying a news event, it gives it a, a certainty rating uh, based on how likely it is that it's true. So we're, trying to, so we're finding out about things earlier than we used to in part by using technology. Um, and also when you have people in so many places, you're, you're often the first person there. Um, just because we're around, uh, almost any big story, there's some, one of our reporters just happens to be in the neighborhood. Um, so recently, uh, in a, in, there was an attack in, in, in Britain, and they, would, they cordoned off a zone, but it, it was on, uh, on the train. And we had both a, a former editor-in-chief happen to live in that zone, and so we used his, his apartment window as a headquarters. To, and, and there were some people commuting who were in that zone. Uh, we had somebody in the Las Vegas airport who was on her way back from a vacation who what, happened to be there and ran to the scene. And, and so, um, you know, we, I think partly by being big, we have a good chance to be first. We also pick up the social media stuff if, uh, quickly. Uh, we have social media monitors all over the place, so we're watching for, for what's going on. But it is difficult to be first. Yeah. One more. Last one. Don't fight over it. Hi. Hi. Um, so my question for you is, based on how social media has basically like, taken a big part in millennials and how we like view the news, how would you say the world would be different if we did kind of follow that um, aspect you were talking about before, like focusing on looking at both sides of the news story and being able to decipher between like what's, I guess, genuinely fake news and the, the real news? How would the world look like if we did follow that, would you say? Yeah. Well, again, it's my profession, but I believe that when people have better information, they make better decisions. Mm -hmm. And I, I can't dictate what the decision they, they would make is, but I, it, it seems obvious if you just think about your own life. Um, you know, if you're deciding to buy a car and you go to a website and it rates cars and it tells you about mileage and it's accurate, and you say, okay, I care about mileage, I care about safety, I'm going to buy this car. Um, you'll make a better decision and multiply that by every decision you make. You'll live a better life because you're using good information. If you are sold a bill of goods by somebody who's a scam artist and makes it sound like it's news but it's really an infomercial and it's not news and they're steering you to something that's not in your benefit, then that's not as good for you. So I, I think the more people can understand the difference between good and bad information and rely on good information, that actually leads to people making better decisions and living better lives. Thank you. Okay, thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Really appreciate it.